So, you probably clicked this video out of curiosity or out of fear, I said I'm done with Heavy Gear 4E for now, I never said anything about the second edition, Heavy Gear 2nd edition is, as the name implied, the second edition of Heavy Gear Tabletop RPG, and naturally, like any mech themed TTRPG, you can customize the heck out of them or even build entirely new ones. But let's talk about other example of mech or vehicle customization system first, in most of these games, whether in tabletop RPG or video game, you get the point system, essentially, every vehicle has a limit of things they can have under a set number, whether that's a simulationist term like mass or volume, or it's literally just an arbitrary number. To further differentiate and specialize vehicle under different categories, sometimes you can only mount different things on mount points with different sizes, allowing a vehicle to specialize in one or two aspects rather than making it so that a bigger number always means better, the whole point of the system is simple, limitation, to keep things in control of a scope, and balance, between chassis or frames to encourage players to switch things out as needed. You basically add or minus the number as close to the limit as possible to squeeze out everything you can, simple, it's what worked for Battletech, Star Siege, Armored Core, and most likely many more vehicle games in the future too, even Lancer does this in a vastly simpler way. War games also often use the same mechanic to limit the scope and maintain balance between the opponents, as much as it can, and Battletech, happens to be a tabletop war game with an extensive vehicle creation and customization system, thus being the only tabletop game that can really be compared to what's going on in Heavy Gear 2E. Where Battletech started as a war game first and tabletop RPG second, Heavy Gear started as TTRPG first and war game second, and it resulted in a very different set of priority, unlike in Battletech where every different unit type like mech, vehicle, VTOL, and aircraft, needs different set of rigid charts and formulas to create, Heavy Gear 2E used a very freeform purpose-oriented system, where you aren't designing things in terms of category, and more what you are using it for. And also heavily depends on what budget you have. Originally, I wasn't really gonna make a whole video about this, until I opened up the second edition technical manual and on the very first page of the vehicle construction rule, I got reintroduced to the concept of root and exponent, that's when I knew I'm gonna have a good time. <laughs> I'm in danger! Anyway, here's how it works. You want to calculate out three different aspects of your vehicle, offensive score, defensive score, and miscellaneous score. Offensive score is your offensive capability like the guns and how good you shoot. Weapons with limited or 360 turreted art have their value changed. Vehicle with punching capability also get that value added in. And ammo amount is added into the cost too, which can be rather significant, like say for missile weapons. There's also fire control modifier, which can significantly impact your final offensive score, as in a d6 system, even a plus 1 to all attack would be a dramatic change, let alone a plus 5. Defensive score is your armor thickness, your speed, and your maneuverability, this is where the math gets complicated, even more so when your vehicle has multiple movement types like every gear ever, and yes, this means you can totally design a flying mech, but only the complete insane would try to make something like that. Like fire control modifier, there's maneuver score, which affects how controllable a vehicle is, and also how well it dodge incoming fire, a plus 7 basically turns the vehicle into Chirico so that multiplier can get very high. Fun fact, armor rating actually translates into a real world value, and a hunter has as much armor protection as a T-72 tank, with some heavier gear approaching even M1 Abram level of protection, and that's not even getting into actual tank, this is protection level in every direction too, unlike modern armored vehicle that has to prioritize frontal and only frontal protection due to weight limit. Finally, there's miscellaneous score, which is everything else, number of crews, comms range, sensor range, fuel range, power level of onboard electronic, and the many many perks and flaws of a vehicle, this is the bread and butter of heavy gear 2e vehicle construction system, as it is used to really differentiate the capability of each vehicle, you can expect 3 for common gears and more for more advanced machines. These scores are then added together and divided by 3, making the final threat value, which is used to balance combat encounter, the threat value is also used to calculate default size and cost, which are not the final size and cost value of the vehicle yet, as size can make quite a few differences in the game, smaller unit can move easier over any terrain or obstacle, more of it can be transported by air or land, and a 5 unit squad of size 6 vehicles, the standard size for a gear, can sit in a single hex and concentrate fire on anything, however, larger unit is often cheaper, because they aren't being miniaturized, and can carry bigger weapons with more ammo for them too. Yes, even the max amount of ammo you can carry per weapon is dependent on the minimum size and your vehicle size, 
it's why one of the Hunter variant has a snub cannon that only has three shots, and the game actively discourage carrying extra magazines because they can explode with full power, and you can't modify existing vehicle with an actual ammo storage system. On the other hand, gears are designed to be expendable, so having too much ammo is just a waste. Long story short, if you are designing a gear and find its default size to be bigger than 6 or 7, just squish it down and pay for the extra cost. However, you are still not done calculating the final cost yet, as you still need to apply one more multiplier, you have to decide whether this is some kind of super prototype, limited production model, mass produced workhorse, or a ramshackle patchwork built by one dedicated and insane person. This is why the system stood out to me after the initial impression, you aren't just, I don't know, cramping money to make a robot full of guns, you are telling the whole story of why this thing exists, and your decision here affects the final cost, which can be 100 times the value for the initial prototype, to half when it reached mass production capability, which is why the final cost of the hunter ended up being so damn cheap, it's everywhere. Production types also don't just affect the cost, it also affects how many flaws a vehicle can get, here's a thing called lemon dice, you roll it and if you get unlucky, your vehicle will suck in a certain way, up to and including getting major flaw, and the number of lemon dices you have to roll increase depending on the production type and how many perks you have put onto your vehicle, the more advanced a thing is, the more likely something gets screwed up. The lemon dice is also separated into two different defects, model defects, and individual defects. Model defects are the flaws introduced in the designing phase of a vehicle, the only way to remove this is via a complete redesign, the same reason why you see military vehicle in war underwent so many changes while nothing dramatic seems to have changed outside, Individual defects are instead, defects introduced when constructing a vehicle, these are completely random, and thankfully, can be fixed in time, which you might not have if you have to get deployed like right now with a new machine. The lemon dice mechanic really just tells the backstory of a vehicle on its own, a prototype obviously will have many flaws, a newly released machine is gonna fix most of these problems but not all of it will be away, and in wartime, there's only so much you can do to keep cheap mass produced machines functioning at peak efficiency right out of the factory. Limited production lines sort of fix this by making sure everything is alright before shipping things out, but now you have to pay for a lot more. This just changes the way I look at designing a vehicle for a military sci-fi, it's not just this is good or this is expensive, sometimes you just have a wonderful idea and then it's actually shit, sometimes you don't want to rock the boat so much and it's also shit, the fact that there's a real difference between limited production and mass production models in 2E just stuns my mind. We always have this moment when reading up history or sci-fi military story and just goes, why don't they just make more of these amazing machines, like obviously some nerds on the internet is gonna have a better understanding of a wartime need of a nation than people fucking living over there, and sometimes, the problem is they fucking can't and if they do it any faster, shit is gonna break. And the most amazing part of this is that Heavy Gear 2E has a system for player to scratch build their own Franken vehicle, at the cost of more flaws than you can shake your hands at, but even then, Heavy Gear 2E has more support for Franken mech than bloody Battletech itself, but, for most people, you won't really be interacting with the system much, because if you do play Heavy Gear 2E, you most likely will just only modify your personal gear. Modifying a vehicle in Heavy Gear 2E is thankfully much more simpler than building a whole damn thing, you can add a number of new perks, new weapon, armor, or even enhance the speed of your vehicles, Hunter is especially useful here as it is easy to modify, which explains all the different variants it gets in 2E, and all you need to do is pass one dice roll, just one. Still, not all perks can be modified with or without a workshop, for really extensive modification to your ace custom, a direct line to a factory would be required and even then, it will basically be a whole new thing, still, everything else, is basically fair game, until you reach the limit that is the game master's patience. All I'm saying is that this freeform customization system actually encourages the players to modify their own ride, within the confines of the rule, I'm sure a lot of you with experience on Battletech love to customize stuff and also love to just ignore the rule completely, because it is just dumb waiting for a team of technicians to spend 4000 hours switching a different models of medium lasers in your battle mech. And now we are at the end of the video, obviously, as much as I praised the Heavy Gear 2E construction system, it still has a lot of flaws, but it is charming in its own janky way, the same system is also used in Heavy Gear 2, albeit a vastly simplified one, and that too gives that game a feel of uniqueness in the turbulent sea of all the mech warrior clones at the time. Though honestly, I would say the Heavy Gear 2E construction system was quite underutilized even in its own era, the production type was clearly meant to describe a sense of time, various gears are in prototype stage around this era, which by logic, 
could be developed into a new line of machines in future era or get consigned to history due to critical flaws. But that barely happened as the setting barely moved years ahead before switching to Heavy Gear 3rd edition and oh boy that was a disaster. Dream Pod 9 original team moved on, Heavy Gear Blitz get introduced as a successful mecha war game to fund future projects, and only last year, did Heavy Gear 4th edition finally get released with a new look, and new customization mechanic, maybe we might see new version of the 2E construction rule one day in 4E, maybe not, most likely not actually, but I think it's still good to remember what the system has tried as a piece of important TTRPG history. Not all artifacts of history need to be an actual physical item, sometimes it can just be a pile of math. Anyway, that's all for now, and I will see you all next time. Hello there, if you like this video, please subscribe and click that notification bell button. If you want to see the videos early as well as further support my channel, you can join in my Patreon page, or buy me some Kofi, links in the description. Anyway, have a nice day.